Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 16, chapter 16, verses 13 onwards. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please be seated. My dear brothers and sisters, we are dealing with something that he himself has taught us. Now again, this is not my teaching, this is, this is the teaching of the church, the church in which we are the member. Jesus is the only God, he is the only Messiah, only Savior. Now, when the church teaches us that Jesus is the only Savior or only God, it is not asking us to blindly believe this statement. Our faith, our Catholic faith, is not a blind belief. Some people say that, when you start believing in God, you have to stop reasoning or you have to stop thinking because there is no role of intellect when you come to believe in God. Now that is rubbish. It's nonsense. Because Catholic Church teaches us that we need both reason and faith. Catholic Church never teaches us to stop thinking or to stop reasoning. On the other hand, the Catholic Church encourages each and every one of its member to think, to rationalize, and to grow in faith. And that's the model we read in the, in the gospel about St. Thomas. St. Thomas, who is often labeled as Doubting Thomas. He had doubts, he had questions, and so we often present him as in, a, in a negative light. But then there is this great lesson to be learned from St. Thomas. St. Thomas doubted, definitely, he had some questions. But then, he's directing his questions, he's directing his doubt in a, in a very good way. He's using his doubts, he's using his skepticism to grow deeper in his faith in Jesus. That's what we read. St. Thomas making his confession, my Lord, my God. The greatest confession of faith that we find in the scripture is coming from the mouth of a doubting Thomas. A man who is having so many questions and a man who is, who is having this skeptic mind. He is using his doubt, he is using his intellect and reason to grow deeper in his faith. My Lord, and my God. That's what the use of reason is. The reason that God has given to us. Now, whatever we have, it's a gift from God. Whatever we have, our intellect, our reason is a gift from God. And it can be used only when we are growing in faith. Whatever gift we have received from God, we can either use it or we can misuse it. Another great gift that we all have received is the gift of freedom. I can make choices. That's a great gift. Animals don't have that. Human beings have the gift of freedom. That's one thing that makes us different from animals. But again, it's up to me whether I can use it or misuse it. Same way, when God has given me the intellect, I can either use the intellect or I can misuse it. When I'm using the intellect, what happens? I grow deeper and deeper in my faith. Whereas when I'm misusing the intellect, I go away and away from God. So let us be very clear. There's two ways that we can deal with the intellect or reason that we have got. Either we can use it or we can misuse it. We can use it by growing deeper in faith and that's what we find in the life of St. Thomas. He's using his intellect and reason to grow deeper in faith. Now, St. John Paul II, one of the prominent figures 
in our recent history. St. John Paul II says, we need both faith and reason. Just like a bird needs both the wings. The bird needs both the wings to soar high in the sky. It has to use both the wings. Same way, a believer needs both faith and reason to go deeper and deeper into the eternal truths that God has revealed to us. In the absence of one, the other becomes dysfunctional. So if our belief is not based on reason, it just becomes a superstition. It's a superstition. If you're believing something and there is no rational ground for that, it's just a superstition, nothing else. For example, you might find people who believe that number 13 is unlucky. Number 13 is unlucky. There's no rational ground for that. But people believe it. We name it as superstition. Or there are people who believe that when a black cat crosses their path, something unfortunate is going to happen. Now again, there's nothing rational ground over which this belief is based. A black cat crossing the path can affect my life. And so there are people who are so afraid of black cats. There are people afraid of 13, number 13. When it comes on Friday, they don't do anything. It's double unlucky. So these are superstitions. Now, Catholic faith is not a superstition. It's a faith that is based on reason and intellect. And that's what we are going to do a little research. It is what basis that we are believing that Jesus is the only God. That Jesus is the only Savior. There is God. That is a very intellectual, very logical conclusion. Because if there is a creation, there should be a creator. That's how science works. You are all people who have studied science. The basic assumption of science is there is a cause. There's a cause for everything. If I'm having a sickness in my body, there's a cause. And that what the science is doing, it finds out that cause. So that it can deal with the sickness. Same way the phenomenon in the nature. Science is assuming that there is a cause for everything that is happening. And so the science goes on to find out what that cause is. There's nothing here that happens by chance. I remember that famous quote by Albert Einstein, one of the greatest minds of human history, greatest scientist, who gave us the theory of relativity. Now he finds that there are many things that are happening which he cannot make sense. And then he says, the things that he not, he's not able to understand, he says, definitely God cannot play dice with us. We know that play of dice is a play of chance. A great scientist who is using his intellect and reason, he says, there are things that I am not able to understand. But then definitely I know that God cannot play dice with us. There's nothing which is happening here by chance. There's a reason for everything. There's a cause for everything. So to believe that there is a creator, there is a God, is nothing illogical. It's something which is based on the scientific assumptions. There's a creator. If there is a creation, there is a creator. So we are not dealing with that more. We're dealing with this question, who that creator is. How can we come to a conclusion that Jesus is that creator or Jesus is that God? Now there are many people here. What if, if I perform a miracle here? I perform a miracle here and then if I begin my homily or my sermon, I know that everyone will attend with utmost concentration. That's the work of a miracle. Miracle often gets the attention of the people. Something supernatural happening. Now, often when we speak about Jesus, we think about Jesus, we think about the miracles that he performed. There are so many miracles that he performed. And so, people come to this conclusion that he is God. Now, I have nothing against miracles. Miracles are good. And God can perform miracles because he can do anything. He can do anything. He is above the, the order, the natural order. He can do things supernatural. So I have nothing against miracles. If I am believing that God is performing miracles, good, right, fine, very well. 
But I just have a suggestion to all of you, my dear brothers and sisters. Do not become a person obsessed with miracles. There are some people who have this obsession with miracles. Wherever they find that there's something supernatural is happening, they come to the conclusion that it's God. Now that is not a logical conclusion. Because the scripture teaches us that even Satan can perform miracles. Even Satan can do deeds that are seemingly supernatural for us. For example, we read in the book of Exodus, Moses going to Pharaoh with the message of God. And Moses is performing some miracles to, to confirm that he has come from God, that he has come with the message of God. He's performing some miracles. What is Pharaoh doing? Pharaoh is calling his mag magicians. And these magicians are doing the same miracles that Moses is doing. So, please don't get obsessed with miracles. There are people today who just run to every place when they find, oh, there is something that is happening there. Or this man is doing something great or something supernatural. Remember the words of Jesus. The time will come when you will hear, here is the Messiah, there is the Messiah. Don't run to those places. Even fake messiahs can do such things. Even Satan can perform miracles. There are people who just go and worship Satan. And why are they going there to worship Satan? To get their things done quickly. I want to remind you, my dear brothers and sisters, today there are many people around us who, are, who have just submitted themselves to Satan to get some instant fame, instant money or instant prosperity and so I want to caution you also that the music that we hear or the celebrities that we adore let us be very cautious because some of them are people who are worshippers of Satan why do they do that in order to get instant fame in order to get instant name. Therefore, let us not just accept everything what the world is giving to us. Let us be prudent, as Jesus says. Be prudent like snakes. Satan is working in the world. And therefore, let us not run to every place saying that, oh, this is something supernatural happening here. And so this is God. No. The word of God is teaching us even Satan can perform miracles or things that, that, that is a wonder for us. Let's not have only that thing in our mind when we, when we speak about Jesus. The approach that we are taking here is a completely different approach and that is, as we said, is the approach based on reason, based on intellect. Why do the Catholics say that Jesus is the only God? Now, I remember a girl who came to me who was, brought to, who was brought by her parents. Was brought by her parents and the parents were sad about this girl. They said, I don't know, I don't know what, we don't know what happened with this girl. She was such a devout person. She was going to the church. She was believing in God. She was believing in Jesus. But all of a sudden, her attitude has changed. She no more believes that Jesus is God. She says that Jesus is one of the gods. There are so many gods. What's special, special about Jesus? All those things coming up, so many doubts. Please talk to her, Father. And then I started talking to her and, and she's saying, she has no problem in believing that Jesus is a good man. He's a great teacher, he's a prophet, or he's a very noble person. She has no problem in believing that. But then, where did Jesus say that he is God? Now, I take some of the instances from the Bible where Jesus is claiming himself to be God. It's only that we have not researched the Bible that we don't find the places where Jesus has claimed that he is God. For example, we read in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8, verses 58. 
Gospel of St. John chapter 8 verse 58 Jesus says Before Abraham was I am What's the meaning of that statement? Before Abraham was Abraham lived centuries before the time of Jesus And Jesus is addressing the Jewish crowd The Jewish crowd they heard what Jesus is saying Before Abraham was I am What does he mean? They ask You are still not 50 and you are talking that you were there before Abraham. What does that mean? There's only one conclusion. That he is God. If he is not God, he cannot exist before Abraham. It's only God who is existing from the beginning. So when Jesus says, before Abraham was, before your father was, the father in whom you have kept your trust, before him I am. I am the beginning. There's one place where Jesus is claiming himself to be God. Another, Gospel of St. John chapter 14. Gospel of St. John chapter 14 verses 8 and 9. Gospel of St. John chapter 14 verses 8 and 9. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and still you do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Again, what's the meaning of that statement? If you see me, you see the Father. Jesus is that Father. Jesus is that eternal God, who is the creator, who is the maker, who is the almighty. Very clearly he is claiming himself to be that God in whom the Jewish people have put their trust. We take another instance from the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 9. Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 9. We read Jesus healing the paralytic. These few people, they brought a man who is suffering with paralysis. Jesus is healing him. Now, how is he healing him? Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. He says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, that's a breathtaking statement that Jesus is making there. Because Jesus knows, as a Jewish person, he knows that the belief of the Jewish people is only God can forgive sins. No human being can forgive sins. And there are so many people gathered there. All of them are Jewish people. When he says, your sins are forgiven, automatically there are people there who are grumbling and complaining. How can this man say that your sins are forgiven? Who does he think that he is? Is he God? That's precisely the point Jesus is making. I am the God who forgives the sins. It's I who have the authority to forgive sins. There's no one else. I'm that God in whom you believe is having the authority to forgive sin. I am that God. My dear brothers and sisters, there have been so many prophets before Jesus. So many prophets came. Mighty prophets. Moses, Elijah, Elisha. So many great prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. So many prophets came before Jesus. And they have done so many great wonders. The things that Jesus did, even those people did. Jesus raised people from death. Even Elijah did that. If you're reading about Elijah, we find he was a great prophet who is raising people from death. But, but, none of them claimed that they are God. None of them claimed that they can forgive sins. They never passed such a statement, your sins are forgiven. No matter how great the prophets were, they never claimed, your sins are forgiven. It's only from the mouth of Jesus people are listening now. Your sins are forgiven. Who does he think he is? My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is very clear and very distinct with his words. He's claiming himself to be God. We take Gospel of St. Luke chapter 14 verse 26. Gospel of St. Luke chapter 14 verse 26. Jesus says, Unless you love me more than your father, more than your mother. 
unless you love me more than your very life you are not worthy of me okay that's a breath taking statement that jesus is making there who can say that unless you love me more than your life you are not worthy to be with me only god can say that because god is the ultimate good there is no other good greater than god and so god is saying if you love something else more than me you are not worthy of me if you love your husband if you love your wife if you love your children more than me you're not worthy of me if you love your life more than me you're not worthy of me it's only god who can say that and so jesus is making that statement if you don't love me more than your very life you're not worthy of me here is another statement where jesus is claiming himself to be god praise the lord praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah now if you don't believe in bible as we said we are we are basing our faith on reason so there might be people who don't believe in bible how can they come to the conclusion that jesus is the only god you take the history the history of human kind which is written by secular secular historians like josephus is a jewish historian or you take and read the history written by tacitus a roman historian they speak about jesus they have written about jesus because he was a historical figure we are not speaking about a man who was not existing jesus was a historical figure by the way a real person so in the history you find about jesus being written down by so many people it's not only the bible we find about jesus there are so many other places that people are speaking about him if you read about jesus the account of these historians you understand what was the reason of his death why was he crucified why he was brutally murdered all the historians they have they have no argument in coming to this conclusion they all believe they, they all write that jesus was a figure who was attracting crowds to himself if you read this history you find that so many people were following jesus so many people in thousands people were following jesus because as we said one thing we often get attracted to miracles said attention gathering so jesus as the gospel is teaching us he was performing miracles and naturally there were people who were following him so why was why was he put to death in a very in a very young age at the age of 33 people crucified him what's the reason only one reason because he claimed himself to be god jewish people cannot accept that he made himself equal to god that's the reason that he was crucified there's no other reason why he was crucified because he was a good man he went around doing good he was a great moral teacher the reason that he was crucified he claimed himself to be god now even if you don't believe in bible this is what the history is speaking to us jesus claimed himself to be god and that is why he was crucified praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah praise you jesus thank you jesus now there are only two possibilities my dear brothers and sisters only two possibilities either jesus is god or he is a bad man either jesus is god or he is a liar only two possibilities if i believe that jesus is a good man or if i believe that jesus was a great moral teacher then automatically i am led to believe that jesus is god because no great person no great person can can be so confused about his identity he was a great person there is no doubt about it the very history is based upon jesus jesus is taken as the point of reference in the ear of the lord the world has taken jesus as the point of reference bc and ad before christ and ad in the ear of the lord and no domini 
the world will not take an ordinary person as a point of reference definitely he should be a great personality that means we are talking about a great figure in the history a great figure who claimed himself to be god so that's what we are saying the claims of jesus either we have to believe it all of them not just we pick and choose what what we like we believe those claims what we don't like we don't believe either we believe jesus that he is god or either we believe that he was a bad man he was a liar he was deceiving people by saying that he is god only two possibilities there's no middle way there's no one who can say that he is a god is a he is a great teacher but i don't believe that he is god it's a contradiction because if he is a good man if he is a great teacher he has to say the truth now that is what that is what jesus is doing my dear brothers and sisters one more thing that i want to bring into your attention if we want to know who the true god is there is only one way if we use our reason there's only one way and that way is this god has to come down and tell that he is god there's no other way now why do we say that there is only one rational way because we know that we are limited in so many ways we have a very limited mind we have very limited ears on this earth we are limited by so many conditions and circumstances and when we are speaking about god we are speaking about something or someone who is not limited by anything is an infinite reality now if i say that i understand god with my intellect totally i have the complete picture of god using my intellect it's a fallacy logical fallacy because a finite mind cannot grasp the infinite reality if someone says i'm using my intellect and i have come to know the complete picture of god just using my intellect it's a lie he has not got god maybe he has got something according to his convenience he has made a god of his own that's all of course we are not saying that we are not saying that we cannot understand anything about god using our intellect if we use our reason we can come to certain conclusions about god that's true but we cannot come to the complete picture of who that god is just by using reason because as we said a finite mind cannot understand an infinite mind praise the lord hallelujah hallelujah
Sacrament divine, all praise and all worship. Be every Be moment, every moment thine. Thank you, Jesus, for having come, at, come amidst us to bless us. We confess to you that we are sinners. We are unworthy servants, Lord. We disobeyed your commandments and we broke the everlasting covenant with you Lord due to which we lost our anointing of the Holy Spirit we disobeyed you Lord we went astray from you like the prodigal son we are coming back to you lord we need you lord we need you without you we will never be able to live a successful fruitful life in this world and will never be able to reach our eternal home 
heaven we need you lord you are the way and you are the only way to the eternal abode to the eternal father so we believe in you lord we trust in you lord we repent of all our sins which we committed by word deed thought and omission lord forgive our sins and offenses and wash us in your blood and fill us with your holy spirit o oh lord my dear friends second chronicles 714 we read after the consecration of the jerusalem temple when solomon the third king of the people of israel offered the temple of god for god's ministry god in a dream spoke to solomon god said so many things one among them is this if my people who bear my name my people who are called by my name humble themselves seek me and turn away from their wicked ways and pray these are the things which god expected from them his own people the people of israel and now in this situation it is about all human beings not only about israelites or christians or catholics every child of god whoever wants to be in union with the god god says you are known by name you are carrying my name you are god's children we have to humble ourselves and then seek my face see god in every moment of life and in everything and turn away from the wicked ways that's very very important the wicked crooked cunning sinful satanic way everything will take us into the eternal damnation disastrous end but there is only one way which we have to select that is jesus christ john 14 verse 6 i am the way the only way and we have to be in that way and if they turn away from the wicked ways and pray to me and this is what we do now we are praying and god says i will listen them from heaven i will forgive their sins and i will give i will, I, i will give prosperity to the land the material blessings which we need to live a peaceful and prosperous life in the world god will provide if we are in that way and pray and turn away from the wicked way now let's pray the trinity prayer your response will be fill us with your holy spirit fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify us in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify our minds in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify our bodies in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify our intellect in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify our memories in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify our whole body in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit abba father purify every member of the body every cell of the body in the holy blood of jesus and fill us with your holy spirit now the response is fill them with your holy spirit abba father purify our family members in the holy blood of jesus and fill them with your holy spirit abba father purify our neighbors in the holy blood of jesus and fill them with your holy spirit abba father purify our relatives in the holy blood of jesus and fill them with your holy spirit abba father purify our friends in the holy blood of jesus and fill them with your holy spirit abba father purify our colleagues in the holy blood of jesus and 
and fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify our superiors and subordinates in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify our civil authorities in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify our spiritual fathers in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all the believers in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all those who belong to other legions in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all those who are attending this adoration in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all the sick in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all the broken hearted in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify you all those who are affected by the COVID-19 virus in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify the bedridden ones in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all those who are the brink of death in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all those who met with accidents in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all those who are requested our prayer in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all the sinners in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify the whole humanity, 7.6 billion people in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify the Catholic Church in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify the Pope and bishops in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all the religious in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify the laity in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Abba Father, purify all those who are requested our prayer in the holy blood of Jesus. And fill them with your Holy Spirit. Now let us receive the final blessing, O Sacrament Most Holy. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine, be every moment. Let us journey with our Lord Jesus Christ through the most precious hours of our salvation. Inviting you for the Passover retreat led by Father Augustine Valuran, the retreat will be held at Divine Retreat Center Muringur from the 10th of April Palm Sunday at 10 a.m. and concludes with the Good Friday service on April 15th at 1 p.m. For details of the Holy Week retreat, Email us at divine retreat center at gmail.com. The Ministry of the Divine Retreat Center needs your support as they continue in their commitment to preach the good news of Jesus through the weekly retreats, the daily online and television ministry, through the service of 3,000 disadvantaged persons, the mentally challenged, the aged, the destitute women and children, the sick and abandoned and economically disadvantaged families. If you are inspired to share in this ministry through the sacred service of almsgiving, we invite you to send your love offering to Divine Charitable Trust, CD account number 04022310000014, HDFC Bank, Chalakudi Branch, IFSC Code, HDFC 0000402, and email the details to Divine Retreat Center at gmail.com